Hey there, Dan Gastro here. Today's video is about installing the Raymarine sonar transducers, putting the anodes on the boat, and is proudly sponsored by MarineEngine.com. Alright, this box contains the Real Vision Raymarine transducers that I need for this boat. Here they are. Ooh. I've gone the plastic ones, they come in different materials, but because it's a steel hull, I've got the plastic so it's not a dissimilar metal problem. Modern plastics though, are incredibly strong. Unfortunately, cheap plastic gives good plastic a bad name. But these are certainly not made out of cheap plastic. I like these transducers, a lot of thought's gone into them. Obviously, really well marked. This way's forward, it's on the starboard, the keel's this way. You've got the main thread we have to cut, so I'll show you that soon. Then there's another bolt that stops the transducer being able to rotate. With transducers, it's really important that you get a clean flow of water over them. And I've seen other types of transducers where this anti-rotation bolt, oddly, is actually at the front. So you get a little bit of turbulence over this, and then you actually get to the transducer. So even just the little simple things have been thought out to make sure that you get the best possible result. So, uh, another point worth mentioning, is these are designed for a 20 degree dead rise on the hull. So depending on the slope of your hull, where the transducer is going, you will need to buy different models. You know, if it's a flat bottom skiff or whatever, you know, depending on that slope, it's all built into the transducer. The transducer doesn't have a wedge mount or anything, but knowing the dead rise that's built into the transducer you're buying is really important. This is the template that Raymarine supply for installing the transducers or drilling the holes. So what we need to do, is with the bow this way, drill a hole for a bolt here that's an anti-rotation bolt. What I'm going to do is just take the measurement centre to centre off this plan, mark it on, drill it. So it says it should be 142 millimetres centre to centre. This hole here has a 31 millimetre radius. So we can say then it's 111 edge, edge to centre. Have a look here, so what have we got, 600 from the keel. Keel to the centre, 600 to the keel, so it can probably come down a little bit. To make the uh, transducer straight. I'm just going to sight that from the front. Yeah, that looks pretty good. So, 111 out, 600 to the keel, 600 to the keel. Oh, also, this grey you can see is a couple of coats of epoxy I put on yesterday to stop the fresh steel here from rusting. All right, uh, eight mil drill bit. Yeah, looks fine. If not, we'll go up to an eight and a half. Okay, now let's read the instructions. All right, here are the instructions for installing the transducers. So these particular ones, I think the uh, RV, Real Vision uh, 3D, and then I think the XX probably refers to the dead rise. Uh, in this case, I have 20, 20 degrees. There looks like there's zero for a flat bottom hole. 12 and 20. Don't quote me on that, but I presume that's what this series is about. All right, uh, now, one of the first things they say in the instructions here is to test the transducer. There's a couple of reasons I'm not gonna do the tests right now, and that's because, well, I don't have power to start with, and tides miles out, you know, I could maybe stick them in a bucket, whatever. These things don't like to work out of the water. I think they get quite hot, so, you know, you need to have them in the water, even if it is just dropped in some water to test them. But they actually have a really low failure rate. The reason, from my understanding, that you're asked to test them is because if by some, you know, one in a million shot, you get a dodgy one, 
it's very tricky and murky water with warranty where you then go and launch the boat, go, oh, look, at the port side one's got a fault. Suddenly you're up for all the costs of re-slipping the boat, etc., etc. So it's really just saying, look, test them before you launch the boat again is really what they're saying. I get that, I think it's excellent advice, but for me it's just not really that practical. So I'm gonna be skipping that bit. Yeah, you know, flame me, whatever. Uh, but I think it's a pretty safe bet given how reliable these transducers are. Okay, on with the destructions. So we found our location, which is clear of any obstruction. So we don't have something in front of the transducer producing turbulent water that'll affect the readings the transducer will give us. We want clean water flowing over the transducer. This is our transducer, cables only, yay long. And there is an extension to take it to the wheelhouse and a wire adapter to join the two sides because they're a match pair. First step is just pushing this through. Make sure you leave the cover on here because you've got Sikaflex going everywhere, dust and dirt. It's really important this connector stays clean, so don't take the cover off the connector, definitely. Probably the most important thing is to make sure you've got the right transducer. So starboard side, all these double checks telling you this way goes forward, this way should be towards your keel, and it's starboard side. So you've basically got three things to help you make sure you're in the right place and you have it in the right orientation. Then, once you're 100% sure, peel these stickers off. Now what I'm going to do is get a clean rag and find some alcohol and we're going to give that a wipe to make sure it's clean for the sealant to stick. Alright, just give the plastic a bit of a clean up. And the hull. The sealant I'm using for this job is Sikaflex 291. I've added this Sikaflex to the Amazon store I set up. Not something we're sponsored by or anything, just a really good sealant for doing any sort of marine job, honestly. I've used it for years and years and years and it's always been awesome. So the instructions for this are, apply a thick bead of marine grade sealant, the Sikaflex we're using, all around the base of the transducer stem where it'll meet the hull, around the threaded section of the stem, ensuring that the sealant will protrude approximately six millimeters above the final Titan hull nut, all around the stem hole on the exterior of the hull and all around the anti-rotation bolt on the exterior of the hull. Fair enough. So bead all around both of the holes through the hull. Same on the, the little anti-rotation bolt. Alright. Just going to do a bead around the bottom of the flange here. And then it looks like it talks about coming up the thread. So we're going to be winding the thread through, you know, around the Sikaflex and using the Sikaflex as a, a kind of a sealant and a bit of a Loctite, I guess. So I'll do that with two hands and then we'll push this up in there. There's a little cap over the anti-rotation bolt. So I'll just pop that off. Get the bolt in and just get it in its correct orientation before we get too far. There we go. So. It's funny, I'm really glad I measured from the keel because the transducer looks to be pointed up this way, but then you go to the front of the boat and it looks really nicely aligned to the uh, to the keel as the measurements confirm. So let's jump inside and put that locking nut on. All right, just doing a final clean around here. So I'm just gonna feed the rubber washer over the end of the cable. and run it down onto the hull. Okay. All right, space is pushed down now, so that top face is against the rubber washer. All right, now what we're gonna do is get the locking collar down the cable as well. Get that 
get started. Alright, let's thread it on now. A bit of Sikaflex has oozed out from all those joints, so I'm just going to smooth it off with my finger. Well, I certainly can't see it leaking, that's for sure. Alright, let's clean up. Alright, as you saw, we had to take the stickers off, put the beta Sikaflex on, all that was fine. Then what happens is once you're in, you have a washer and a spacer probably easier to show you these out of the boat now it might be a bit clearer than it was inside there in the dark the washer is quite flexible and it's the bit that goes on first so it just gets fed down over the cable and onto the hull here which is onto a bead of sicker flex as well then it actually says to put a bead of sicker flex on the bottom surface which is the flat surface not the open surface of the spacer then you feed your spacer down. So you've got Sikaflex in between every layer, in between the transducer and the washer, the washer and the spacer. Then you have the top nut. Because the nut's threaded, obviously, there's a very, very minor risk of damaging the cable on the way down. I'd put it at close to zero, but there is a protector that goes inside. Clip that in. So it goes in, bottom of the nuts like this, top of the nuts poking up. Then you can feed it down along your cable. Then when you get down to the point that you need to install the nut itself, it overlaps. I'll show you, pop it out. Because it comes out like this and it can actually push in on itself, you can get it out at the last minute and then wind the nut on. And that's your kind of final installation. Personally, I don't think there's a huge chance of the plastic nut damaging the cable on the way down in any meaningful way. But what I do like about this is it sort of goes to show there's obviously a mindset at Ray Marine that they're trying to think of absolutely everything that can go wrong. And when it comes to navigation gear, I kind of like to know that's the way they're thinking. So it does fill me with confidence, even though I think in this particular case, it's probably overkill, but you know, why not? So. That's the setup it went in. I'm going to do the same with this one. Really hard to film in there. That it's cramped, there's rubbish everywhere, and it's dark, and well, you know. But same thing with the port side. Going to peel the stickers off, give it a clean, stick a flex on here, feed it through, go inside, put the washer, the spacer, then the nut on. When working with sicker flex like this, I'd almost recommend putting kind of quite a few pairs of gloves on if you can, because you're always going to want to rip a layer off, so you've got clean hands to pick up whatever you're working with next. Another job I have to do before the boat goes back in the water is get the anodes on it. I've already got a couple on the rudder, which I've welded the head of the bolt onto it. It's a stainless rudder, so I've welded a stainless bolt onto the rudder. Then I've drilled holes in the straps for the anodes, put them on, put nuts on. So here I've got the head of the bolt welded onto the rudder, then the strap put over the bolt and a nut on. I'll grab a second set of nuts, so we've got some lock nuts here just to make sure it doesn't come undone. I'm going to try a few different ways of attaching them to the keel, see which way it goes best. Here what I've done is drilled a hole through and taken some of the paint off the steel here, so it's still pretty clean steel. Then what I'm going to do is fill the hole and put some of this carbon grease, which is a conductive grease, behind the strap, bolt it up tight and see how that goes. Alright, so a bit of this grease inside and the outside, front and back. More grease in here. Okay.
Got the bolts cranked up pretty tight. Got an adode on both sides. Bolted right through the keel. And you can see here, this is this black conductive carbon grease that's squeezing out. So I'd probably call that the easiest way to attach, but probably the least reliable in that the the connection between the anode and the hull isn't as positive as it is, say, with the welded heads. Third option then is to weld the strap of the anode straight to the hull. These ones, I actually drilled the holes in here. These are designed just to be welded on. So another way to go, the disadvantage to that is that you can't easily change them underwater. I guess my preferred method would be this one where you weld the head, but I'm gonna compare how it goes. I think what I'll do is I'll weld some bolts on down here and we'll do the, uh, the second set along here the same way as here. So we'll be able to compare welded stainless, bolted mild, welded mild. This section of the keel is a nice flat section where I wanna put another anode. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do these ones directly onto the hull because uh, it's the flattest part. So what I'll do is just mark the ends where I'm going to weld so I can grind the paint off. Grind it, weld them on, and then, uh, then I'll just touch up the steel with a bit of anti-foul again. tip for you as well uh, welding these on it's much better if you bend these straps a little bit otherwise there's quite a gap between the straps and the keel that I'm welding it onto uh, which gives you quite a big gap to fill because the first bolt can go anywhere it's the second bolt that has to be the correct distance from the first one I've just been tacking the bolt on the first bolt just by holding it oh and out of interest this welder is earthed through the hull going on to the head of the bolt that's bolted through with that uh, conductive grease on it so obviously there's a reasonably good connection because it's welding fine how long it stays that way is the real test though first bolt welded on, I'll hang the anode off the front bolt and then tack the back bolt on. I've also just put a nut on the bolt to keep the anode itself away from the head that I'm trying to weld, give myself some clearance. So there, locking it on like that just makes it easier to tack weld. Once it's tacked on, just take it off, weld it out. Next time I do a boat, and yes, there probably will be a next time, believe it or not, I uh, definitely gonna mount it higher on the stands. All right, gonna put a bit of uh, graphite grease on the threads. Hopefully the graphite grease will mean that corrosion doesn't put uh, increased uh, resistance and make it a bad connection. All right, now I'm just gonna touch up the anti-foul around the bolts, under the stands, all those kind of places that need either touching up or couldn't be reached before. 
This is the areas that I welded inside and burnt the paint off. Ended up putting four new gal bolts into the rudder here. So I may as well just anti-foul over the whole thing. Can't see any reason not to. With anodes, it's important that you don't paint over them. The idea is that the zinc contacts the seawater. A little bit of anti-foul on the non-contacting threads. Isn't gonna hurt though. There's enough anti fowl left to go right round the waterline again, so I'm just doing from the chine up again all the way around. It's an area of heavy growth and also one of the more visible areas. Well, that's it for this week now. I think it was a pretty good week in some ways. It's actually a short week. It's only Wednesday afternoon now, but tomorrow Howley and I are heading back up to Coffs Harbour to finally pick up his boat Delstar 2 and bring it down the coast. So I'll definitely do a video on that trip as I promised originally. There isn't that much left to do on the boat now to get it floating again. I'm really keen to get it on the mooring. Uh, a few people commented they said it was a bad idea to get it on the mooring rather than finishing on the hard stand. Um, but I disagree, you know, I think it's going to be much nicer to work there. Uh, contrary to what people might think, I've actually thought about it. I've got a plan, I've got everything I need. You know, it's not just a spur of the moment decision without anything to back it up. So, to that end, I spoke to the crane company today. It'll make you laugh if it doesn't make you cry. But it turns out that since I pulled the boat out of the water, all the cranes now have been chipped and they're not allowed to come across the bridge to the south or to the north of this town. So there's actually no way for a crane of that size to get to this boat anymore. Awesome, hey? Turns out all I can really do is get two small franner cranes that can cross the bridges, one to lift the front, one to lift the back, and then somehow coordinate it. it means it's gonna to have to go into the wall pretty close to the wall, parallel to the wall, won't be able to reach out very far. Is what it is. Anyway, so all I've got to do now is pick a date based on the tides, give them a heads up, and I'll lock that in. Once that's locked in, you know, at least I'll have a date I know I'm working to. And we're talking two or three weeks away. I'm actually going on holidays with my wife after I get back from Coffs Harbour, so having a little break. I've got some videos organised for that period though, so I'll still be uploading, but it won't be till after that the boat goes back in the water. The list of things to do is pretty short. I've got a propeller protector I want to put on. I've got to organise something to do with the three seacocks. I need to figure out whether I'm going to put the old ones back in or go to a slightly smaller diameter, newer style with a whole new arrangement. Uh, I've got to finally get around to putting the legs on the stands that hold the boat up. And after that, I think we're pretty much done. Oh, put the stuffing for the stern gland in as well and find a way to secure the prop without the engine in so that, you know, the hull's watertight ready for launching. But that's really the last few jobs to do before this thing can float again. All right, well, take care and I'll catch you next week. See ya. Thank you.